Shabbat Shalom. What else can I add to what Chris said? Thank you for all the important delivery. And I'm going to speak, skip to a, to a more convenient topic. Actually, the one that's, that's after I picks up, because even though it starts with, with all this woman childbirth issues, it goes into a um, uh, very detailed detail about uh, Tzarat, about laws of Tzarat, and that's what Haftarah picks up. Haftarah actually connects it to Tzarat. Um, tzarat, uh, not, not the Hansen's disease. Uh, it's some kind of a spiritual, biblical skin disease that doesn't occur today anymore. Could only exist when temple existed, because if there's no temple, then how are you going to do with all the purification ritual? Therefore, there's no disease, there's no temple. Um, and uh, it's, the laws are very complex, and there are four different types of tzarat, and, uh, and how the person is sequestered and all that. They're supposed to go to the Kohen. I'm sure there was a specialist Kohen. I'm sure there was some kind of a dermatologist Kohen that had to deal with, with the tzarat issues, you know, because it's just, it's just so specialized. Um, and but the, what, what happened with, it, with a person afflicted, he's supposed to go outside the camp, he's supposed to be there. And the difference between the, the tzarat, for example, and, and the childbirth laws with women with issue of blood is that with women in issue of blood, you know, or other people who touch something unclean, difference is they're going to become clean eventually. It's, a, it's just a matter of time. Time passes, the person goes through the, uh, through the washing, through the, goes to mikvah, goes to, you know, through the, the tefillah. And the person is clean, and he can come back. She can come back. In terms of tzara'at, there's no such guarantee. He can be clean, unclean until he dies, or she, you know? It's equal opportunity in yeah. Um There is no definite end in sight until God decides to, to heal the person. So that's a, you know, and, and that person has to hang out outside the camp for the rest of his life, potentially. Uh, whereas the woman with an issue of blood, she doesn't have to go outside the camp. She's inside the camp. She can't go into the temple, but she's inside the camp. It's an odd guy or, or outside. Um, you can imagine. There's, no, there's nowhere to live. It's like kind of a heartless thing. First of all, you're sick. Second of all, you're outside. It's like, it's like you know, it's a double evil for the person. Um, so, and the... the the pure, so, so suppose, and, and since it's a spiritual disease, obviously, uh, the, uh, then the conclusion is that the cause of that spiritual disease is, is some kind of sin. You know, because otherwise, why would the person merit such a, you know, sh such a hard condition, harsh condition at, at, at the direction of God? God directs this type of procedure. Therefore, there has to be sin behind it to, to warrant such a harsh treatment. What type of sin? Well, everybody, the rabbis say it's Lashon Ra, of course. Of course, it's Lashon Ra. And everybody's uh, it's like, it's, it's, it's the theme of all these Sunday school lessons, Lashon Ra. And of course, Miriam is the, is the example. Miriam's the sister of Moses, if you remember the story. When Moses and Aaron, when Moses, sorry, Miriam and Aaron, they speak against Moses in, in Numbers chapter 12. They speak against Moses because of the uh, Cushite wife that Moses took, whatever that means. And, you know, we, we don't really know what, that, what, what they said. Uh, the uh, one theory is that they were criticizing Moses for abandoning his wife and, and, and now being like only with, with God all the time and not interested in any type of relation with his wife, saying what happened, why is Moses get to, you know, why, why is Moses decides to do this? We are also prophets, says Miriam to Aaron or Aaron to Miriam. We, God did not tell us to abandon our spouses. Why did Moses abandon the spouse? Can be. But then the question is, why, why is uh, the, the, the Torah says that the specifically that a, she's a Kushite woman? Maybe they were criticizing him for marrying a Kushite woman. So we don't know, really. It doesn't say why, uh, except that Miriam is struck with Sarat. Again, woman is punished. What's wrong with, what's up with that? You know, why is Miriam punished and not Aaron? Aaron's not punished with Sarat. Why is Miriam punished? What's, you know, what's up with that? This guy, this guy is kind of mis, 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 misogynistic. Um, well, the only thing I can tell from the text 
in the story of Miriam, it says, it says Miriam and Aaron. So Miriam is first in that couple. So it seems like Miriam was the initiator. She initiated this whole discussion, therefore she, she got Sarat. Um, of course, she's uncleansed. Uh, but there is something, the fact, the, the, the fact that the uh, result of the Tzara'at is the exile from the camp, the exile, you know, inevitably makes you think of the first exile, which is the Garden of Eden exile. And they're both exiled from the Garden of Eden, well, not for evil speech, necessarily. They were exiled for the evil act. They disobeyed. But at the same time, speech always precedes the act. And we know that the, the woman first spoke to, to the snake, and then they spoke to the husband, and, and so on and so forth. So the speech ensued, and therefore, they were kicked out. So both were exiled from the garden, and they could not come back after a certain time. They could only come back if God would permit them to come back. God didn't. But if he would have, they could have. So, only with God's permission could the, could the Mitzorah return. There is a famous case of the Mitzorah in the Bible uh, that's the case of King Uzziah. Uh, you're familiar with the story? I'm going to read it. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Uh, King Uzziah, he is the one who built this huge army. He is the most, uh, I guess, str he was the strongest king after King David. He has a huge army. He was very proud. He says, when he became strong, his heart grew so haughty that he acted corruptly. He trespassed against the Lord his God by entering into the temple of God, burned incense upon the altar of incense. Then the Zariah, the Kohen, and 80 valiant Kohenim of the Lord followed him. They opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn, to burn incense to Lord, but for the Kohanim, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have acted unfaithfully. You will have no honor from Lord God. Then Uzziah, who had censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry. While he was raging at the Kohanim, Tzara'at broke out at his forehead, right in front of the Kohanim, in the house of the Lord, beside the incense altar. Then Azariah, the chief coin, and all the other Kohanim stared at him. Behold, his forehead had Sarat. So they rushed him out of there. Indeed, he himself hurried to get out because the Lord had smitten him. And then it says, the king Uzziah had Sarat until the day of his death. He never was healed. He lived, that's the case, exactly the case. He lived in a separate house with Sarat, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Yotam, his son, was in charge of king's house and governed the people of the land. Now the rest of Acts of Uzziah from beginning to end were recorded by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. Son of Isaiah, son of Amos, right? When did Isaiah start speaking, record, started receiving his prophetic vision? According to the sages, that's the events that are described in Isaiah chapter 6, which started as follows. It says, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robes filled the temple. And there were seraphims standing about above the throne with six wings, with two he covered his feet, with two he covered his eyes or face, with two he flew. And they said, Kadosh, 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 Adonai, Savot, Noko, Haris, Kodo, and so on and so forth, said they. And what did Isaiah say? As a, as a result, it says, Oi to me, for woe to me, for I'm ruined, for I am what? A man of unclean lips, dwelling with people with unclean lips, the one who speaks Lashonara. It's like, how am I better than the king Uzziah who went into the temple, was struck with Sarat? Yeah, he didn't necessarily he didn't say that he said something, he just did it, but probably his deed was preceded by much words of pride. And Isaiah said, I'm no better. I am here, I'm no better, I'm undone, I'm ruined. What's, you know, woe to me, what does God do? He cleanses him, he, so he, he sends an angel with a call, angels touch, touch his lips, he's clean, but so... And Isaiah then commissioned to go and proclaim this message. Message of what? It's, God says, go and proclaim. Says, who, who will go for us as God? And Isaiah says, okay, here I am, send me. And God says, 
uh, go and say to these people, they will have ears, will not hear, they will have eyes and they will not see, go and proclaim this people. It says, how long, Lord? How, when is my mission going to end? Is there, an, is there an end period of my mission? He said, until cities are laid waste without inhabitants, houses without people, the land is utterly desolate, the Lord will drive people far away, the destruction of the land will be vast until everybody's out. So your mission has no end. It's like until you die, you're going to be this proclaimer of this bad news to the people until they're out. You're not going to succeed in your message, in your proclamation, says God to, to Isaiah. Your mission has no end. You are going to be like a leper to them, so to speak, for the rest of your life in exile, until they're exiled like the lepers from the land. Although Isaiah's book is divided, we know there's two parts. One is the part of the woe and, uh, and, 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 and um, judgment, and the other is part of consolation. So Isaiah is divided into two parts. He's a prophet of woe and doom, and, but he's also a prophet of consolation. Proclaiming what? Proclaiming the good news. As it is said, Manavu al kacharim ragaleim vaser. Mashmiya Shalom, Mevasertov, Mashmiya Yeshua, Omer Lezion Malach Luchaich. He is called Mevaser. Why, if God chooses leprosy as this type of a sin, uh, sin consequence disease, it's not like gout, it's not, you know, any type of other thing. It's this leprosy. Why leprosy? What's, what's, what's up with that? When it's described, it says, when you have a negatzarat beor basaro, it says, on the skin of your flesh, you have the leprosy. It's like, it's very visible. It's something that signals a problem. When somebody has a rash on their skin, they know something is, is wrong with, with, with their health. They have to look deeper, not just, through, not just at, at the symptom, but at the underlying cause. And the fact that it says, it says beor basaro, on the skin of the flesh. Is there any other skin? I mean, it's all, all of it is the skin of the flesh. Why does it have to say on the skin of the flesh? The word for the flesh, basar, it's the same word as mevaser. The mevaser is the messenger. Basar is the flesh. It's the same word. Messenger and flesh or meat is the same word. Isaiah is the, all the prophets are messengers, but first and foremost is Isaiah who says these things about the Mavaser. He says about the messenger in Isaiah 52, 7, says, Manavu al how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him, of the messenger who brings the good news, Besorot Tovot. The good news, Besorot Tova, has the word Basar in it. Meet or message. It says, how beautiful are the feet of mountains, who brings the good news, who announces shalom, who brings good news to have happiness, who renounces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they will lift up their voices. Together they're shouting for joy. They will see eye to eye when the Lord returns to Zion. Break forth in joy, sing together your ruins of Jerusalem. for Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all nations, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation, Yeshuat Eloheinu, the salvation of our God. Leave, leave, get out of there, touch no unclean thing, go out of her midst, purify yourself, you could carry vessels of the Lord, for you will not go out in haste, nor you will go in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be a rear guard this is the return of the land to the land is described when people are now permitted to return when they're cleansed from all their sins this is the message of the good news that you can return and then what what the next verse in isaiah the messenger announces the salvation of the mashiach he says behold my servant the mashiach he will prosper he'll be high and lifted up and greatly exalted just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was disfigured more than any man, like a leper. His form more than the sons of man, so he will sprinkle many nations. 
Kings will shut their mouth because of him, for he had not been to- for what had not been told them they will see, and what they have not heard they will perceive. Who has believed our report, and to whom the hand of the Lord has been revealed? So on and so forth. This is what's going to be told to the king of the earth. This report about the Mashiach who is disfigured and who is smitten and stricken like a leper. And in fact, that's what Talmud bears it out in, a, in this passage from Sanhedrin 98b. It says about the Mashiach, Gemara asks, what is his name? School of Rabbi Shailah says, Shiloh is his name, for it is stated, it's play on words, Shiloh, Shailah, until Shiloh come, Genesis 49, 10. The school of, uh, school of Rabbi Yanai says, Yinon, again, play of words, Yanai and Yinon. Yinon is his name. It is stated, may his name endure forever, may his name continue, Yinon, as long as the sun and may, many men will bless themselves by him, Psalm 72, 17. The school of Rabbi Hanina says, Hanina is his name. It is stated, for I will show you no, no favor, no Hanina, Jeremiah 16, 13. Some say Menachem, Ben Hiskiah is his name, stated because this Menachem, the comforter, should relieve my soul is far from me, lamentations. And the rabbis say, the leper of the house of the rabbi is his name, as it is stated. Indeed, our illness he did bear, our pains he endured, yet we esteemed him injured, stricken by God, and afflicted, Isaiah 53, verse 4. That's the Talmud quote about the fact that it indeed speaks about the Mashiach. So there's a lot of anti-missionaries who say, no, it talks about the Jewish people. Uh, well, no, Talmud says, speaks that it does say, speak about Mashiach. So... But isn't, aren't we, as the people, aren't we in this predicament right now? It's because we have spoken against the Mashiach, because we do treat him like a Mitzorah, because we treat the Mashiach like an exile as a people of Israel and don't accept him. We find ourselves in this predicament because our king is not leading us. You know, we have this strongest army in the Middle East. Well, guess what? They ran out of ammunition in two months without the Uncle Sam support. <laughs> you know, in these days, God is on the side of big battalions. It doesn't matter how high-tech your army is. It runs out of high-tech ammunition pretty quickly. <laughs> and the cheap stuff lasts for a long time and overwhelms. So it doesn't really matter how high-tech someone is. Rude awakening. But it doesn't really matter, right? Israel can win with nothing and lose with everything. I mean, this huge affliction was, huge breach was dealt to our people by the weakest of our enemies. Isn't that because our rock has sold us? And our king, our God, has given us over? That the weakest of our enemy can put thousands of us to flight? But when the Mashiach comes, he'll deliver us from no matter what quantity of the enemies, of course. He'll surely come to save us and return us to our land. Today, we are seen as a leper by the entire humanity. Jewish people are seen as a leper and as a colonial power in the land of Israel by all the useful idiots who scream free Palestine. You know? Colonial power of who? Of which, co- of which colony? Of whom? Of uh, elders of Zion? You know? <laughs> who, who, who sent co- colonial power? So the met- met- metropolis sends somebody to somebody, some other land to colonize. Where's Jewish metropolis? Whatever. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's like, it's too much detail. It's too complicated. You no, know, we just have to stick to slogans. And we just have to wait until we come back. It says, all Israel has a share in the world to come. It's hard to believe, but this is what it says. All Israel shall be saved. Talmud says, all Israel shall be saved, except for like four people. Four people are, there's oh, three kings and four commoners. And the four commoners, the list is Balaam, son of Beor, Doeg the Edomite, Achitophel, and Gehazi. Not sure why Balaam, because he's not a Jew, but okay, he's listed there. Doeg is also kind of not a Jew. He's an Edomite. 
Uh, Achitofel, okay, he's a Jew, and Gehazi is a Jew. Um, what do these, all these guys have in common? All of these guys had some bad things to say, apparently. Uh, well, I don't know. Balaam had bad things to say because he gave bad advice to the uh, uh, Balak, king of Moab. Doag, son of Doag the Edomite, he had bad things to say because he informed King Saul that David came to the priest. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot the name of the priest, but when Saul came and killed all the priests, so Doag was that informant. Achitophel, of course, was the one who counseled Abs Absalom, son, uh, David's son, to rebel. There's a lot of evil speech there. And Gehazi, well, he didn't ever say anything bad. He just went, r ran after Naaman to t take the money. You know, to say, I'm going to go after Naaman, and he became a leper as a result. He didn't say anything. And actually, Talmud says in the other place that Gehazi actually does have a share in the world to come. Well, you know, to all these, you know, Jews that don't have a share in the world to come, we're also probably going to add, like, Karl Marx and Trotsky and Bernie Sanders. But... <laughs> but... <laughs> But Gehazi has a share in the world to come. And Bernie Sanders, by the way, too, if he repents, still alive. So, like, if he repents, he's also going to have a share in the world to come. So, Bernie Sanders, if you watch this video. Um, but Gehazi, uh, he says he has a share in the world to come. Why? Because there was, a, there was a, in this in these first uh, eight chapters of the book of Second Kings, it's commonly not commonly known, but it's known as Megillat Elisha. Uh, because it describes um, uh, the uh, exploits of Elisha, all the miracles that happened with Elisha and, and all these, you know, fantastic stories and miracles. And one of those things that are described was uh, when Gehazi, it's already, uh, it seems like Elisha is not, not, not around, but the king has Gehazi next to him and the king tell, asks Gehazi, tell me about all these exploits of Elisha that he did, like remind me of all the miracles, so to speak, because probably to, to encourage himself or something because the situation was tough. And Gehazi starts telling the stories, and he tells the story of the, of the Shunammite woman who uh, had her son um, uh, given back to her from the dead. And when, as he tells the story, the Shunammite woman comes and uh, asks for her land to be returned to her because, because there was a famine in the land, and she was seven years in the land of the Philistines. She came back to take her land back, but Perhaps somebody you know, took, took over the land, otherwise she wouldn't have come to the king to ask for it. Uh, apparently somebody took over her land while she was gone, and she, asked, she came to the king to, to ask for the land back. At that same time, when her story was told to the king uh, about how Prophet Elisha gave her son back to life, and the king, of course, was touched. So, Here's that woman, by the way. What would the king do? And, you know, of course, give her everything. First of all, give her land, and give her not just the land, but everything that the land was produced in seven years, also give her. So he like, blesses her in an amazing way because she just comes at the right time. Just like, you know, who's outside, you know, Haman's outside. What should be done to a man whom king wants to honor? Is like, just like when the king was re re reading about Mordechai's, exp you know, so, so, how Mordechai saved. Same type of situation. And so her land was restored to her. So rabbis say because Gehazi was instrumental in returning the land to the woman, he also has a share in the world to come, which is like a piece of land to you in the world to come, Helek. Helek is like a piece of land, right? So just because he was instrumental in returning the land so that, uh, so the, uh, to the woman, he is going to get share in the world to come as well. You know, returning of the land this is like returning to the garden. It's the same thing. It's a, the, the Torah has a recurring theme. When Yeshua comes and starts his ministry, first thing he does, apparently, according to Luke, um, he goes to the synagogue after he is in the desert for 40 days being tempted. He emerges from the desert. He goes to the synagogue, uh, reads from the Aftara, um, from Isaiah, uh, don't know what day it is, but probably some time before Rosh Hashanah, because all these, prof all these Isaiah prophecies that have to do with consolation, they're read in the seven weeks before Rosh Hashanah, between Tisha B'Av and Rosh Hashanah, the seven, the seven of consolation, all these prophecies are read. So he reads from Isaiah 61, this is, Spirit of the Lord is on me. Uh, he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, Besorot Tavot. 
He has sent me to proclaim release of the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of Lord's favor. What is the year of Lord's favor? That's why I think Rosh Hashanah, because the new year, right? But what is the year of Lord's favor? That's, that's the Yovel, that's the Jubilee year. What happens in the Yovel? What happens in the year of Jubilee? The land returns to the owners. He proclaims this return of everything that's lost is returned to you. Everything that has ever been sold, you get it back. It's like, it's like where does it happen? It only happens in the kingdom of God. So he proclaims this, and the people, what do they say? Well, it's amazing, but by the way, that's a carpenter's kid, you know, we know who that is, whatever, you know. And then he says, but he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. But with all truthfulness, I say to you that there are many widows in Israel in days of Elijah, when heaven closed for three and a half years, and there came great famine over all the land. Elijah was not sent to any of them, but only to Tzarfat in the land of Sidon to a widowed woman. And there were many of the what Tzara'at in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them were purified apart from Naaman, the Syrian. Who has believed our report? To whom the hand of the Lord has been revealed? To the nations first, it was revealed. And to us, what about us? The year of favors proclaimed. <laughs> we missed it. We're like the Mitzorah outside the camp as the people of Israel. And us who believe we're like the Mitzorah within the Mitzorah. We're like a leper of lepers. <laughs> we're outside of the outside. <laughs> And it is written, so let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the one that is to come through Yeshua. Then let us continually offer up God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips, giving thanks to his name. The lips that are cleansed with the call from the altar. Saying, holy, 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 saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. We are outside the camp like a leper, but we have been cleansed and we're proclaiming to Zion, your God reigns. So what we say until we're blue in the face, until the cities are dead. They were already desolate. We're back in the land, but we don't own it. Nobody, <laughs> United Nations in the, in the one, you know, moment of insanity voted for Israel in 1947. <laughs> Never since then. <laughs> in one moment of insanity. Why? Because God did it so. And right now we find ourselves as a people in this, <sighs> between the straits and hard pressed. And we are the only ones that have this message of salvation, of consolation, because nothing else will help, nothing else will do it. We are like the Mitzora, but that's okay. Because we're also in a good company. And so is our king. And when we don't tire of proclaiming, we don't have a guarantee of time. It's not like it's happened. It's going to happen in a week, in 33 days, or in 66 days. Maybe it's not going to happen in our lifetime. We don't know. The cleansing of that leper can happen at any moment at God's decision. But it does not relieve us of responsibility to proclaim. Call mevasar mevasar vayoimer. The voice of the messenger messengers and proclaims. Your God reigns, Zion. Let God decide when he comes back. Our job is to, to proclaim and not get tired. Shabbat shalom.